Well, hi, everybody. It's uh, February the 1st, 2024. It's uh, David Lees here. I'm your proud host of Leaders on the Frontier and a warm welcome to everybody. We're so glad that you could join us live on X and live on YouTube. We've got a really quite an interesting topic today, and uh, it's all about are we at war uh, with uh, what's called China, the Communist Party of China, to be precise. And uh, it's really quite a, a revealing question. As we peel the perennial onion, we're going to go down deep into a lot of different levels of this question. And uh, you probably haven't heard that question posed before. So I hope you bear with us and we're welcoming your comments and your questions. So we're um, delighted by our ever growing audience. In fact, it's amazing. This week we've uh, blown the barrier with um, Apple Podcasts as uh, in the top 50. Uh, news uh, podcasts in in uh, in the country, so we're really delighted by that. So keep subscribing and sharing, liking, get into those algorithms that the the uh, so-called tech gods uh, have so much power over. Uh, but we really do appreciate your comments and feedback, and it's really been very exciting. So a warm welcome to everybody. And speaking of which, I want to extend a warm welcome to our uh, special guest, uh, Scott McGregor. Uh, Scott uh, is an author of, uh, of a number of uh, very interesting articles and an, um, analyses and, and a book called The Mosaic Effect, which deals with this very question. So welcome, Scott. Hi, thank you for having me, David. Well, Scott, it's great to have you because uh, you are an intelligence professional. You've done a lot of work across uh, the RCMP, uh, military intelligence services, and, and internationally as well. And so it's with that kind of background and insight that uh, we're going to talk today about um, a very important question, and that is, is Canada at war with with China? What do you think, Scott? Well, you know, I would like to say that I don't think Canada realizes that we're at war. Um, but what we do know is that China is definitely at war with Canada. And we know well, that. We know that. We, there's evidence for this, yes. Okay. And it's, it's not just a little bit of evidence, right, Scott? It's it's um, a, a, a boatload of, of evidence that shows that China's waging war with Canada, but we're kind of, what, what the heck, why wouldn't Canada be aware of this? Yeah, the, there's empirical evidence. Um, one of the biggest ones I think that people are probably most familiar with is the cyber attacks. Um, and that, you know, China is attacking our government institutions in British Columbia alone, just, just in British Columbia, 6,000 times a minute. Um, and that's all from the state. That's not some kid hacking in his basement somewhere. That's um, wow. That's a government military establishment that's conducting okay, that. So, so the headline is that the CPC, under their state authority, is is got armies of people waging cyber attacks on Canada. Why would they do that? I mean, I know they're doing that right across the West and, and beyond, but why would you be waging cyber attacks on another country like that? Uh, there's there's a number of reasons. Um, part of it is to collect information so that uh, you know they can further their agendas. <clears throat> the Chinese have come out and stated that they want global domination by the year 2050, um, yeah. and and they're taking action um, globally to that to that end. Um, so why why attack Canada? Um, a lot of it is control. A lot of it is about getting inside, infiltrating, um, putting some back doors in. Um, causing disruption. There's, there's a number of reasons that they're doing it. Um, it's also an easy backdoor into, into the United States. Um, and that's what the book is about is the fact that Canada is such a soft target that we have become a national security threat to the United States. What do you mean we're a soft target? Surely we're, we're tough Canadians, aren't we, Scott? What, what are you talking about? I, I think, you know, we, we like to, um, believe that we are, um, you know, we have an intelligence population, but intelligent population. But the fact of the matter is we don't have the the means, we don't have the capability or assets uh, to confront the Chinese, uh, let alone enforce any of the, the activity that they're conducting. Some of it, this activity is licit, a lot of it is illicit. Um, but, you know, our justice system and legislation allows for a lot of this activity to, to continue. That's why we have the National Inquiry coming up to talk about foreign interference. Um, you know, and foreign interference is just a small portion of hybrid warfare, which is what the Chinese are conducting against Canada. Okay, so this is a bit like an iceberg, if you will. We're seeing only part of it. 
we see cyber attacks all the time. I mean, it's coming from somewhere and we know um, to a large degree where it's coming from and uh, China is a big source of it. And we also have, as you mentioned this week, the launching of Canada's inquiry into foreign influence. It's multifaceted. So do you have any hope that that inquiry is going to really get at the heart of these issues and, and show the kind of um, influence that the CPC has had on past federal elections, and which is clearly a, a big problem, and elsewhere? Is, do you have any hope that that inquiry is going to get at the bottom of it? Uh, to be honest, I, I, I don't. I think there will be things and revelations for people that um, don't know what's going on. I think it will be of interest to them. Um, I think there will be... Um, you know, there'll be information that's provided that's going to generate some awareness of what's happening. I think a lot of it will be explained away, though. I mean, and the reason for that is that the corruption and uh, uh, compromise runs so deep uh, that it, it, it will impact heavily all of our political parties, um, a lot of our corporations. Um, you know, things that Canadians believe uh, are, are still operating efficiently. Um, and while we can, you know, keep the country running and going, uh, economically, we're suffering terribly. Um, and, and to blame just the government for mismanagement is, is one reason, but I would dare say the intent of the Chinese and, and some other nations um, is, is quite extensive. Okay, so we're going to dive into that, but just to make sure we don't miss the headline. So you're saying the inquiry is more about a political message that, wow, we're we're, we're looking at this issue of Chinese influence now that the cat's out of the bag and people are becoming more uh, aware of this. The people that are running these inquiries, they don't necessarily want to get to the bottom of it because it kind of implicates them. Is that yeah. the risk that we're facing? Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Um, they've been leveraged into having to do something here. Um, and they've been given enough time to start to make some, uh, some, some manipulations of their own um, the people that are, are uh, being given standing uh, are, are questionable. Um, the people that aren't given standing speaks volumes. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be another whitewash, just like the BC money laundering inquiry. Oh, wow. Okay, well, let's, let's hope you're wrong, but we need to keep our eyes open. So what do you think in terms of the audience? What do you think is going on here in terms of warfare on Canada and the West, as well as uh, do you see any hope for the inquiry that's... Uh, that's just been launched this week. Um, and so as, as you think about your questions, we'd love to hear them. Please pose them and, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, put them in our discussion here. But I do want to tell you, Scott, you have a very interesting story because um, you've kind of had your own revelation. In fact, I, I would say the mosaic, mosaic effect, the book that you read, kind of uh, gives a, a, a glimpse into that story of understanding this very issue that Canada is being systematically undermined and attacked uh, by China, obviously not through kinetic warfare, but through other forms of warfare. So can you tell us in a nutshell how you came to this revelation yourself? Ooh, in a nutshell, it's hard. It, you know, it, it took a, uh, a couple careers, I guess you would say. Um, my time in the military overseas, um, getting an understanding of what transnational organized crime was and how it relates to national security. Uh -huh. um, and then when I moved uh, from the military uh, to the RCMP as a, an intelligence advisor to federal serious organized crime, um, you know, generating that, that interest um, because there were people that were starting to sort of uncover things, but didn't know what it, it exactly meant. Um, so we, uh, you know, I brought in the term hybrid warfare um, and they start to understand a bit better how nation states conduct, um, you know, this this type of uh, unrestricted, um, you know, fight in the gray zone, if you will. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that that sort of opened it up. I was given a pilot project to look into convergences between transnational organized crime and national security, um, because within Canadian law enforcement, um, unlike the rest of the Five Eyes. Um, we don't have a, a policy on national security, or pardon me, on transnational organized crime, making it a national security threat. Um, in 2011, Obama did that. Um, and that allowed law enforcement and other uh, agencies like the, you know, the CIA, et cetera, that have classified information to be able to share that information. We don't have that in Canada. And so I was given, um, you know, 
the ability to look at all of the files, um, both on the classified side and on the uh, protected side. Uh, and we saw the convergences between entities that were, were you know, conducting illicit activity, um, but also national security level crimes, if you will. And so, yeah, by, by doing that, we, we start to, to open our eyes to exactly the extent of what's happening. And the center of gravity really is, is the, the Chinese influence. Um, yes, we have we have others. We have Iranians and cartels, and they're all working together. Like this doesn't happen in isolation. Um, but the fact that nation states, state sponsored activities occurring, um, you know, is a bit of a, a shocker. Um, and it it kind of I think it to be honest, it set the RCMP back a bit because they're not they're not ready to deal with something that big. Okay, um, so, so so just hold on for a sec. There, you've said a lot there, Scott. That. Yes. Um, could kind of fly past us here. But you're saying essentially that there's all this transnational crime going on, and that's joined at the hip with a key state actor, namely the superpower named China. Is that what you're, so they're working together against Canada? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, hybrid warfare is basically um, transnational organized crime, which includes threat finance, and the subset of that is money laundering. Um, it includes sharp power, which is political influence, and okay. soft power, which is the economic side. So economic subversion of a country. Um, and, and then what we're seeing with the uh, the foreign interference piece in our politics. Those are the three main categories. Um, that you'll, you'll see if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're intrigued by hybrid warfare and you, you start to Google it, you'll see that there's other uh, terminology that's utilized, cognitive warfare and psychological operations yeah. and all these other things. Um, because it impacts every level of, of uh, society. So so this isn't some type of theory. This is going on every day because it's hybrid warfare. It's not kinetic warfare. It's not like we've got guns out um, fighting each other through through regular armed forces, per se. But mm -hmm. we're put, they've put everything on the table. So you have to kind of look at it through that lens. Is that right, Scott? Uh, yes. I mean, there's... There's actual government reference documents um, that identify these things within the Five Eyes community. Um, law enforcement is, is woken up to it. Um, in Canada, CSIS, our domestic intelligence agency, is, is um, waking up to it. So, um, you know, being focused on counterterrorism for so long, uh, this is, this you know, there's been awareness. Uh, my, a colleague of mine, Michelle Juno Katsuya, wrote uh, a report uh, called the Sidewinder Report, which was classified with the RCMP. Very and important. It, uh, if I, yeah, it's quite important. And it really, you know, touches on how um, government, you know, politicians and uh, our corporate world um, have been manipulated and, and influenced by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, some of it unwittingly and some of it, you know, uh, I would have to say complicit. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of information that's been brewing for a number of years. Um, I know this book really made uh, uh, Michelle quite quite happy uh, because that information finally came out um, and, is, and is available to the public so they can make their own determination. And as we're seeing, sentiment towards China is is changing because of the awareness around the activity that they're conducting in Canada. Yeah, indeed. So this is a clear and present danger, as we say it. Um, uh, throughout history, if we look at uh, the Soviets, among others, uh, this is a clear and present danger. So is Canada really coming together now? Do you see a, a glimmer of hope? Like, I know the inquiry, you, you, you would be skeptical of it, but surely, well, let me put it this way. If, if we had this conversation, say, five, let alone 10 years ago, I think the tone around the perception around China would have been very different. Like, I would say very positive, generally kind of naive, uh, if, if I can use that word. But it's it's shifting now, is it not, as people wake up a bit more? But this is not a common conversation, is it, Scott, still? No, it's, it's still a con the conversation that is had generally um, is that they're not, the awareness isn't there. People are so busy going to and from work. And, you know, they're worried about the normal things like gangs that are going on, downtown homelessness, um, the price of vegetables at the store. Yeah. Um, and they don't look at root cause necessarily, even even within law enforcement itself. Understanding those things is difficult because you're so wrapped up in a single investigation. You're not allowed to look outside of it because that's, in, you know, that would ruin the disclosure, et cetera, in, in court. 
Um, but I tell you, you know, we've spoken to a number of uh, Chinese dissidents, um, and you know how they've been treated by the, you know, the the mainland Chinese. Hmm. Um, these things are, are are now coming to fruition, and that's really driving um, Canadians' perceptions because we are naive and because we believe in you know fairness and etc. Um, you know, we we called the the uh, the Uyghur genocide what it was a genocide. And people are like, hey, that's not right. And China's conducting this activity. You know, human rights are being. And, and, uh, and I should clarify the, the Uyghurs are the the uh, Muslim um, uh, minority in uh, China, which is often used for um, really, in effect, slave labor to produce all kinds of goods, um, including things that you might even be wearing on your shoes. Yeah, they're in concentration camps. You know, they're in they're in uh, political rehabilitation camps. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's terrible. I mean, there's whole commissions on what's going on there. And, uh, unfortunately we, we're yet to see like, like, uh, the Mujahideen or anyone else step up and come in to try to, to help them. Like we did see with the, with the Chechens in, in Russia. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that, that level of control is, is definitely concerning. Canadian sentiment is, is slowly turning. Um, but I dare say whenever we've spoken to Chinese nationals, you know, if when you ask the question, if if Canada end up going to war with China, who would you side with? I mean, there's no doubt they go to it with China. It's a superpower. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's scary because you think that you get a taste of freedom that you're going to want to go with, the you know, the side that's that's about, you know, human rights and, and, and having your democratic uh, abilities to vote people in and that kind of. No, no, they have no interest. They know that the Chinese are, are dominant and they want to see the rise of China. So let's uh, talk a little bit more about hybrid warfare. If we look at the 360 degree overview of these issues, um, we can see a lot of patterns. I think what you have often alluded to, uh, Scott, in conversation with you is the art of connecting the dots. So if you look at, for example, um, if we think of the question, how would this be impacting Canadians' lives? Let's just think of transnational crime. And I want to give you one example that comes on my radar right away, and that would be uh, the whole phenomenon of the importation of fentanyl um, through all these borders. And because we know that I, I think most fentanyl, if not all of it, is produced in China. Is that correct? No. So a lot of fentanyl is produced in China. And in the beginning, I would say that that was probably quite true. Um, we had the DEA um, scientists come to RCMP and we had a giant meeting with, um, you know, all the different agencies, et cetera. There must've been 50 people in the room. And the dialogue around synthetic narcotics um, is, is, a, is a, a complex one. Um, you only have to change one molecule and suddenly it's no longer a, you know, a, a controlled substance, which makes it very difficult to arrest people. Now, because it's synthetic, what we see is, and unfortunately, something I'm going to be telling your viewers right now is the government, the federal government was providing money to try to stop China from sending, you know, fentanyl in, in uh, pages of a book um, where, you know, you, you can order it on the black, the black market and it's going to come here. And if CBSA gets it, they'll just send you another one for free. So we, it's very difficult to stop that. So you have a factory in China and one side is producing legitimate fentanyl for use for hospitals. On the other side, well, that's that's the extra quota that goes out the back door. Well, uh, and they make more money that way. So, oh, so just to clarify, yeah. so a lot of fentanyl is coming in through what in effect the parcel mail service because it's just so small. It's, it's so potent um, that uh, that can be divided up and then, integrated in, into the drug system is is that part of the dilemma here so it's very hard to stop this but yet china is is the the majority player when it comes to producing fentanyl is it not it, it certainly is um but i'm gonna i'm gonna throw a, a hook at you here and that is precursors are being sent to canada by the truckloads sixty thousand tons at a time in sea containers um and those are not illegal and so they, they get delivered. And then guess what? We produce our own fentanyl and wow. it gets exported to Horrible. the United States and everywhere else. Um, the funding for fentanyl was, was you know, going to uh, 
to government agencies. And when they found this out, you know, you, you need that money to, to fight this. Um, and so you couldn't come and say, hey, we're also producing this stuff. We are a threat um, to other nations. Australia and the United States have already identified us as a threat to their own countries. This stuff's oh. being sent to Mexico. The worst part is this. In Canada, anybody can buy a pill press. So think about that for a second. Mm -hmm. So pill presses are how you get, um, you know, green 80s, which are fake OxyContin pills that mm -hmm. are made with fentanyl. And these overdoses we see quite often are people that were on the medical system for, you know, normal injuries and were given these narcotics, but mm -hmm. they were cut off. And so they had to find it somewhere. And so this was a promise of, you know, pain relief. Unfortunately, two grains of sand size of fentanyl will kill you. And so these pill presses aren't just used for making fentanyl pills. They're used for making ecstasy and everything else. Mm -hmm. so they're contaminated. They're not hygienic um, by any means. And so you see all these, these pills coming out and, you know, 900 people a year in, in Vancouver are dying from fentanyl overdoses. Yeah. So when it comes to the, um, the whole issue of doing business in China, one of the things I've marked that Scott is that they're, they're, their framework is well established. If you do business in China, you've got to sign essentially a 4951 split with the Chinese in charge. Mm -hmm. So Apple based in China is no longer uh, a North American, American company. It is truly a Chinese company because they're in charge. And then you also have to agree to a systematic transfer of all your intellectual property. So ultimately that IP isn't that the basis for our standard of living that like we're, you know, it's great that people want to access that market in China if you're a business, but at what price? And then we wonder why we are, you know, we are, we, we have a withering manufacturing sector in Canada. Is this not part of their, their strategy? Yes. I mean, from reverse engineering to intellectual property theft, those are, those are huge. So the brain drain from the West where we have the, the greatest innovation, mm -hmm. um, being completely absorbed by China, who then are able to, because they've been in the manufacturing of these, you know, things that Canada needs, the West needs, um, they're able to to uh, to replicate them, and and oftentimes they'll just they will just create a new name for it. Like you could you can go get yourself a pair of Nikes or an Apple phone or whatever, it might not be called that, but the technology is the same, mm -hmm. um, the design may be the same. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely this. Um, this uh loss on on our side um because we can't maintain it uh the chinese are very smart at that they've they've been they've been doing this for a long long time and and how do we stop it that's that's the trick you you, you pull out of there but what's the fallout now suddenly we can't get goods at a, an affordable price given our inflation rates it, it's a cash 22. well so i do have a question from the audience and it is um how do we uh, delink from China. I know that's a, a, often a word that's used, but now that we're doing business with China, is there a way to, I think if I understand the question, step away from China so that we can actually better chart our own course or is that uh, not possible? Well, I think right now, you know, this has been occurring for a while. So this, this isn't, isn't exactly new information. And companies have been trying to uh, to step away from China for their manufacturing. They've gone to countries like Thailand, um, Vietnam, et cetera. The counter to that is China's just gone into Vietnam and Thailand and bought up the corporations that are are being used there. So now you, you can have made in Vietnam written on your shirt, but really it's the same the same regime that's that's controlling it. Um, okay. So that battle's ongoing. I would dare say that you know we're better to look at our, our NAFTA partners and uh, and start refining goods in in our own country as well as in you know Mexico. Well, I and I remember well uh, last summer in 2023, it was a um, a regular uh, visit of state leaders, including the president of Germany and uh, Japan, asking for more energy from Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there is a robust uh, business case. I remember being in London a few summers ago and talking with some some senior people there saying that, well, you know, if, if energy is a concern in, in uh, the UK as well as Europe, because particularly because of security issues with the war between Ukraine and Russia, Canada could supply all the needs of energy, whether it's LNG or like liquefied natural gas and other, like, so 
we have enormous opportunities as a country. And it is incredible that uh, a prime minister says we have no business case to export there. So anyways, that's that's a, another related issue here is that Canada can develop our economy. So this is going to take a while to delink from China, is it not? It, it, it absolutely is. Um, the shortest um, distance between Canada and, and China or, or, you know, just the Southeast Asia um, runs into a place called Prince Rupert up on the British coast, uh, British Columbia coast. Um, well, the bad part is that, yes, we have a pipeline going there. That's fantastic. Except that port is owned by the port of Dubai. The property around that, that location is being bought up by the Chinese as we speak. And um, I dare say that there's, there's some concerns there when the RCMP pulled their federal um, assets out of Prince Rupert. It also has a rail line that is used to distribute goods. So um, there's concerns around us being able to do these things because other people are making money off it instead of nationalizing something um, where Canada gets the, you know, reaps the full benefit of it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's still tweaks that we need to do. We have enough natural resources. We should be refining our own goods. Canada should be one of the richest countries in the world. Um, there's we have no homeless problems. We should have no housing issues. Um, it's, it's astonishing is what it is. It really is. So speaking of energy policy, I do have a question. Is the net zero just transition policies, are they actually supporting China versus helping Canada? Well, when you're comparing Canada to China, I mean, Canada is the, the greatest consumer of coal in the, in the world. So who's polluting the globe the most? And I mean, Carbon wise, I mean, Canada is as green as it comes. We have a population of 45 million people in a massive country. So our, our, our carbon footprint, um, you know, it's, it's admirable that, you know, everyone wants to do their part. You know, um, we don't, we don't want the, uh, you know, the world to be all polluted so that we can't uh, enjoy it. But I mean, you've got to compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges here. Um, if, if those countries aren't doing it and they're, <laughs> never going to do it. But if you look at uh, Canada, we are one of the most diversified energy producers, including uh, both oil and gas, as well as uh, hydroelectric uh, power and nuclear. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, 65% uh, of, of, of Ontario's uh, electricity is produced by the nuclear program. So it's really That's quite a, a remarkable uh, energy powerhouse. And so the irony is that if we work to shut down our oil and gas industry, which is the, 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 the goal of the, the current federal policy, then we are ironically importing all these goods from China and they're produced there with, albeit probably very little environmental protection. And so the irony is that we're actually making the environment worse. Are we not, Scott? That, that would be my estimate too, that, um, I mean, petroleum is used in so many products, it's never going away. Um, the fact that you're trying to limit it um, is definitely concerning, um, given the fact that it's used by all of the superpowers that are e economically stable that require what we have. Um, so are you saving that for when someone else takes us over and then they can like it's, it's very concerning that our natural resources aren't being refined in our own country um, and then being sent back to us at a higher cost? Uh, in the name of trade relations, that's, don't get me wrong. It's nice to be friendly with everyone and help them out and, you know, spread the wealth. Um, but, you know, selling everything off in bulk and then buying it back, you know, at 10, a hundred times what it, you know, would have cost us to develop ourselves, I, I think is a bit foolhardy. It really is. Um, so Scott, it's interesting, you know, if we look at uh, the history of China, there's a long, long history and, and it's a, it's really incredible the um, Chinese culture and um, uh, accomplishments on so many fronts. But one of the things that's interesting about Chinese history is that they have an ability to work with neighbors and basically work with the elites of those neighbors to basically get them under influence and control. And you alluded to that as the phenomenon of hard power, the exercise of influence the Chinese have over our elites. And that's, um, you know, obviously a, 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 a relationship in foreign affairs referred to commonly as, like they're, they're, they, they have a history of creating vassal states, basically nearby states that operate but are actually within the orbit and firm influence and control 
of China. So is Canada now at this time a vassal state of China? I know that sounds like a an absurd question, but does that is that a fair question? You know, in in the circles that I run in, um, in my intelligence network, and um, and speaking to some very uh, insightful individuals that are, are Chinese dissidents, um, they've come right out and said that Canada is already a vassal state of China. Um, diplomatic warfare, you know, if that falls under political warfare or whatever you want like to call it, um, is definitely something the Chinese engage in and, and are have perfected in, in a lot of ways compromising from our grassroots to our federal politics is a classic example of exactly how you can control a country mm -hmm. um, and, and, and move it towards, um, you know, your stated agenda, which like I stated earlier was global control by 2050. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just happening in Canada. Canada just happens to be one of the easier targets um, and, and is right next door to the United States. We're, we're the, we're the perfect place um, for them to, to try and gain influence, um, gain control, um, and undermine the United States. That's the larger target. Um, okay. but Canada is the, Canada is the victim of all that. Okay. So they really, as you see it geopolitically, they're very much obviously, um, competing head to head with their other superpower, namely the United States. So Canada is an, an easy entry point, but Canada has also a lot to offer. If you look at surely the objectives of China, and that is to keep the Communist Party of China firmly in power. And part of that is feeding the overall control and economic future of the country. So Canada, with its resources, is a natural target. Is it not, Scott? Absolutely. Um, you know, China's, China's suffering right now. You know, um, Xi Jinping came out publicly and, and told the population not to throw out their food scraps um, because they import 80% of their food. Um, that, that's why you see probably the largest illicit activity in the world is what the Chinese do with their illegal fishing. Mm -hmm. um, they're raping the world seas. They surrounded the Galapagos Island with 400 vessels. Um, and they're just fishing anywhere they, they want and can. And another side of that is in the South China Sea, for instance, um, fishermen wear two hats. They wear uh, a military hat with the People's Liberation Army Navy. Um, and they'll throw that jacket on and say, hey, we're allowed to fish here and you guys can get out of here. And uh, that's what we're seeing with the Philippines and, and some of that activity there now. Um, wow. Yeah. So so it's a, it's a big deal for them to be able to feed a population of that size. Weaponizing their population has been ongoing for quite some time. If you look at what's happening in Africa, um, when you're sending your, your prisoners to go and work in factories in, in Africa, they're getting countries to adopt the UN as their, their national currency. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which is, you know, tied to, to other countries that are, um, you know, not necessarily in line with uh, Western interests. Um, then, then you'll see that, that, that there's a bigger push here, a global push towards um, hegemony. So if we look at, uh, I should just mention again, I'm talking with um, intelligence um, analyst uh, Scott McGregor, and we're talking about is Canada at war with China? Uh, we certainly see lots of evidence of it. It's not kinetic, but it is certainly present if we look at uh, transnational crime and how the state of China is working with them. Money laundering, uh, gosh, United Front. I think of also the fact that in Canada, we actually have Chinese police stations. How can this be, Scott? Why are they there? And what are they doing? And why are we putting up with it? Uh, again, so the infiltration of Canada goes into all of our institutions. Um, there are Chinese individuals working for the, the state um, in, in, in basically everything that we have in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. And whether that's, you know, using organized crime figures or um, sending people over that go to school that take positions as engineers, um, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and that information is required by Chinese law that any citizen uh, or anyone with, with uh, ancestry, um, is how they look at it, um, is required to provide information back to the government. Wow. Um, so we have espionage being conducted all the time. Uh, our awareness of it is, is slowly increasing. Um, I'm not sure people are aware of, uh, you know, the head of the RCMP's intelligence, Karen Ortis, uh, who's in prison right now, 
part of that is because he was looking into a file um, that I, I help with um, with the RCMP, um, and that was tied to, you know, and I would say tied to because it was a couple doors down from um, the location where the largest money laundering case in Canadian history was occurring, which had directly to do with the Chinese, um, and the people that were there were utilizing the uh, the hardware that uh, was provided through that company. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can look at the fact that uh, Mr. Ortis uh, and who his connections are in, in the Chinese community, how he speaks fluent Chinese, um, uh, who his mentor was, uh, what's happening at the University of British Columbia, um, where we have you know a front figure um, prominently um, uh, you know supporting part of the, the university. Um, and I think we touch on this in the book uh, to a certain extent. Um, but naturally, you know, we have to be very careful when it comes to the, the legal side of this, uh, because a lot of these things haven't been tested in court yet. And part of that is because our justice system isn't up to par um, or near comparable to what the United States has. Um, and so you're taking a big risk when you when you start to, to cite these things um, because there isn't a precedent. precedent, precedent. Um, but we do have you know, knowledge that we're not the only ones looking at this stuff. Law enforcement's looking at this. The RCMP is looking at this. CSIS is looking at this. And that's that's in Canada. All the five eyes are looking at this. The Australians are looking at what's happening in Canada. The Americans, I work extensively yeah. with these and, guys. And, exactly what's going on here. Who are the five eyes? Uh, just remind us of that, uh, Scott. So the five eyes intelligence community is Canada, Australia, Great Britain, the United States, and New Zealand. Hmm. And so that example of Cameron Ortis. Mm-hmm. It's really a, uh, a quite a disturbing example where you had a very senior, really at the highest level, security officer. And this is a, quite a revelation that we just saw in the last few months, was um, charged and convicted with uh, treason espionage, as I recall. And I think is serving how long a sentence, uh, Scott, now? Um, I, I'm not sure if they've actually come up with the, the final um, sentencing. Okay. But, but regardless, it's, it's a very it. issue, a, a serious breach in security, as it appears that he was um, working closely with uh, the Chinese states and operative, and it ended up uh, really compromising Canadian security. And he was, I think, one of the main liaisons with the whole Five Eyes intelligence community. So it's done enormous damage to Canada's standing. And... Um, and issues. So uh, be sure to look at that issue. So if, as we look to the final parts of our discussion here, Scott, I did want to talk more about what we can do um, as Canadians. And, uh, but I do have one question. I welcome questions as uh, to continue to flow in from the audience. And that is, does the Chinese involvement, uh, are they involved as a state actor with human trafficking? Uh, so is, is China involved with human trafficking? Yes. 100%. Um, I actually worked um, the Chinese migrant files when the, the ships came into the West Coast um, and the snake handlers and how, you know, these things, there were already established right. roles for these things. So you're, you're losing me. What are snake handlers? I, I don't understand this. Sure. Like they're handling snakes or people? What do you mean by yeah. that? Yeah. No, it's a title that's given to someone that's in control of the, the, the human smuggling operation. So snake handlers, snake heads. Wow. Yeah. And they, you know, they tend to be the ones that are um, deciding where these people go. A lot of them were headed to the United States, to New York and, and other places. Um, mm-hmm. And they'll become sex traffickers or, you know, they'll work in a fentanyl factory. Who knows? Um, yeah. But yeah, they're they're being used. Uh, they pay their way over and then they don't end up where they think they're going to end up. Uh, wow. They're in there. You know, it's indentured servitude, really. Um, but that's and that's one way. Uh, the other way that, you know, depending on the, the term human smuggler, when you're bringing in um, entities into the country illicitly, uh, there was a gentleman that was arrested, last name was Wang, uh, in Vancouver, who had uh, forged like 5,000 passports. Um, we have birthing clinics in Vancouver, uh, you know, where you're flying over when you're eight months pregnant to have your baby in, in Canada, then flying back a month later. Um, so there's there's lots of ways that that you're compromising our our immigration and uh, mm-hmm. you know, our customs. Yeah. Wow. So um, what I what I find probably 
a surprise, most people would be surprised by this, is the willingness of the Chinese state to work with really anybody and anybody to get their objectives done. And in the process, really undermine the health of our society. And so speaking of health is, of course, culture. Uh, culture is a big deal, whether it comes to uh, a family, an organization, or even a country. So and the example that, that comes to my mind is Chinese technology, specifically TikTok as an example, which is really popular um, among a certain um, age set, a younger one. And what's <laughs> remarkable is that TikTok is very different in China versus as it is in North America or the rest of the West. So in China, my understanding is that, that TikTok is very focused on patriotism and unity and, uh, uh, you know, respecting authority, namely the Communist Party of China. Whereas in North America, TikTok's emphasis is on um, absurd things and, and, and obviously never ending uh, cat videos, but also things that relate to, um, uh, you know, division and hatred. And so October 7, I, I just saw this report coming uh, last week. Um, the number of stories related to the Hamas terrorist group and how they were in fact um, uh, uh, being persecuted unfairly rose by thousands of, of percent. So like, is it a propaganda tool to, to manipulate culture and narrative? And, and are, is the Chinese state to a large measure coordinating and working behind that? So the answer is yes. Um, TikTok is, is uh, one piece of technology that's utilized by the Chinese um, and others. Um, but that subliminal messaging is definitely something that they've been working on for a, a long, long time. Um, so now, you, say, you say subliminal messaging. So is actually using our minds against us some measure. Yeah. Cognitive warfare, um, um, psychological operations, influence operations. Um, and it doesn't seem as obvious because that platform is, is used in a number of ways, you know, like with all the TikTok challenges and hmm. everything else that's out there. And it seems fun and endearing. And, you know, you do have a measure of control because you're going to look at what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact of the matter is when that, that feed is controlled, um, they can, they can target things. So when you collect information on big data like that, you can start to see who looks at what. So right. if you're an if you have anti-government sentiment and you're making TikToks about that, mm -hmm. then you could be more targeted than someone that's looking at cat videos. Um, I'll give you another example. You're getting robocalls on your phone and they come up in Chinese and you don't know what the heck they're saying. So you hang up. Not everybody hangs up. So part of what that is about is identifying who at what number speaks the language and who is an asset should they try to conduct another kind of operation or who can they reach out to? Um, wow. so that information is utilized um, in different ways by intelligence agencies in China. Um, yeah, I mean, there's social credit and corporate credit. That's There are also considerations. Um, you know, I wrote an article about uh, uh, a hot pot place in Vancouver that went viral in Taiwan and India, mainly in Taiwan. Australia, I did an interview with Sky News on it. Um, and they had over 60 casino level cameras inside. And this is in downtown Vancouver, basically. Um, and here you are, you know, you go in there and they're recording who, what you're saying, who you're talking to. Um, when we interviewed the manager, he said it was being sent, the information was being sent back to China um, to their, to their uh, security services. And then they thought they were going to sue us and they didn't. Instead, they, during COVID, when no one could even really hardly go in there, um, they decided to do renovations and they took out all the cameras. No kidding. There's 900 of these all over the all over the world. Um, yeah, so that was about social, social Sorry, credit. So, so to be clear, there, so the state there is monitoring systematically um, emigres and others right around the world. So this is this is really quite a, a massive operation. Oh, there's, I mean, it, it goes much deeper. I mean, depending on how, how deep you want to go. I mean, this, this speaks to, um, you know, collecting DNA from every individual that they can in the world um, or imagery. So if you, you want facial recognition software that can recognize everyone in the world, uh, I can, you know, I get a picture of you. I can tell you who you are um, based on that data set. Um, so there's, there's a lot going on in China. Um, they, they still believe in the master race. 
piece. Um, Pardon me? Uh, I'm, I'm oh, sorry, I'm not aware of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the Han Chinese um, believe that they are a master race. Um, and, and they're looking at ways to Im improve their, their DNA and, um, you know, advance, advance their, uh, their biologics. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of things that are going on right now. Um, I think you'll see some of the biometric stuff come out, um, in, in the news soon. Um, there's been some arrests, uh, in the United States related to these things. Um, but, but yeah, there, there's, there's more similarities to what we saw with the Germans in the second world war than people want to admit. Um, wow. I mean, that's, that's you're cloning animals, and then you you, you say you are not going to clone humans, and mm -hmm. yet, you know, that was how many years ago? Twenty wow. years. Ago. So um, if if we look at things that we can do, like if mm -hmm. we think of policy prescriptions, I mean, we've got this inquiry that you know uh, it it looks a little bit shaky in terms of its ability to really get at things, but surely awareness is a key part of this. We need to wake up with our eyes open when we can actually see. Mm -hmm. But we also need to do other things and pay attention to, uh, well, should we be using TikTok? Probably not, Scott. Um, what are things that we can be, be doing here, Scott, to turn this ship around and, and getting things together, like rebuilding our military, for instance? Yeah, the yeah. Creating, creating the dialogue is the biggest one. And, and uh, you know, taking steps towards, you know, having our elected officials actually do what we ask them to do. Mm -hmm. and holding them accountable. You know, you'll see protests in France where they're burning houses and turning things over because they're upset about their pension. Um, and yet in Canada, you know, we try to protest something and suddenly the government puts the Emergency Measures Act on, which, you know, as we know now, was illegal. We, we are not the outspoken, um, forceful people, uh, but we, we do have power and the people that have always been quiet and gotten along and just gone with it and just, you know, wanted to work hard and, and hope that uh, you get to retirement. Those days are starting to end and you really have to start to speak up and, and you know, speak truth to power because this stuff isn't going away. They count on us not doing anything about it. They count on us not making any changes, you know, to our enforcement, uh, our justice system, our legislation or delaying it or um, deflecting it. And that's what you're gonna see in this national inquiry. Um, mm -hmm. Even the recommendations, I'll tell you right now, the recommendations that come out of this um, are gonna be minimal, they'll be managed. Um, and just like they were with the inquiry for uh, for money laundering. Wow, so you're really challenging us, Scott, to wake up, open up our eyes, not to be passive, um, and to realize that there's a lot of aggressive actions being taken by the Communist Party of, Ch of China against the West, including Canada. And one of those things that, that behooves us to ask, well, what about our institutions? You've talked about elected officials. What about um, the post-secondary side, the universities? Are, have you uh, documented or a lot of evidence that, that those places have been infiltrated with a lot of operatives? Oh, yes. There's, there's tons of uh, reference material out there right now um, in academia, um, in the media. Uh, uh, exactly to what you're speaking to is that those those institutions have been infiltrated heavily in, in the media what do you mean by that uh in the media i mean that there are news articles um covering you know investigative journalists that have, have delved into these things um you're going to look at a lot of universities in the united states and canada that mm -hmm. are completely compromised um in so fact I, I would so dare say there are professors at some of these universities that are frightened yeah, and, and, and so we know a lot of um, cases about this. We're probably only scratching the surface. I think of um, just this past year, um, the, the charges um, and convictions of uh, senior faculty uh, uh, at a number of universities, including Harvard, for uh, being systematically on the payroll of, of mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese and, and, and um, sharing and, and systematically transferring uh, research and knowledge to those agencies. So it, it's shame on them. I mean, it's it's just criminal what's been going on here. So we've taken a really hands-off, naive view of this relationship. So it's about time that we ask our government to get on it. It's not just the inquiry, but it should be a full court press uh, to what? Formulate a team on this, Scott? What would you do? Like basic um, defensive action is to create a team and find out what the heck's going on, isn't it? You, you would hope so. I think that, 
given the current state of affairs within our government, it's very difficult to find or, or have approved um, people that are qualified uh, and have the insight into exactly what's happening because a lot of this is being poo-pooed in Ottawa. Um, mm. And that's, and that's a, that's, that's a problem. I mean, so why, why do you say being poo-pooed? What, what do you mean by that? Uh, I mean that a lot of this stuff's being explained away. I mean, what happened with Han Dong, um, having an official speaking to a Chinese consulate member while we are holding yeah. a Chinese national uh, in jail to be extradited. Can you explain what happened there? If, if people don't know that story, it's, it's really quite outrageous what happened. Yeah, so we have a sitting member of parliament that is in direct communication with the Chinese consulate in Ontario. Um, and, and Lord knows what they're discussing. I mean, there's a lot of uh, mm-hmm. assertions that have been made and, you know, CISA statements that have been apparently leaked. Um, and, and the fact that they're having conversations at all um, during a time when we're holding uh, a Chinese national on uh, criminal activity, uh, which I'm going to bring up, relates to Iran. OK, so this is about China working with Iran, um, which is one of their allies. This is a much bigger thing than people realize. Um, but the fact that he's speaking to them alone is it compromises the national security of Canada. Um, and yet our government decided to just look past it. Um, you know, yeah, but you it and it was absorbed back into the parliament. Yeah. So we had an elected official weighing in with a Chinese consulate, mm-hmm. signaling to them to do what? Not to release the two Michaels. Remember the the two Michaels were were uh, essentially kidnapped in China on on uh, false charges or or supposedly, and they were being held hostage in prison for well over a year. Mm-hmm. And there was an election coming up, and this elected official signaled to the Chinese, "Whatever you do, make sure that you don't release them now." Is that right? So that's, I believe that's what's alleged to have been said. I don't, I, I can't speak to that specifically. Okay. Because I know that there's a lot of controversy around that. But I can tell you this, it's not the first time the Chinese have done the same thing. Um, there's a man named Bin Su out of Richmond uh, who was spying on Boeing. Uh, the Americans had us extradite him back to, back to the United States. Mm-hmm. The Chinese kidnapped two Canadians then too. And unfortunately for the Chinese, this guy spilled the beans, I believe. He got two years for theft, and I believe he's back in Vancouver. I don't even know. Um, But those two Canadians were on the North Korean border. Um, uh, I think they were missionaries. uh, And they were were subsequently released, just like the two Eagles. Um, So kidnap politics is, is is a part of what they do. So in this context, it behooves citizens to speak up to their officials who are supposed to be governing in the interest of who? Canadians. Uh, not in the interests of any other party, let alone um, China. So in this context, uh, does it make any sense as well, um, uh, Scott, to, to look at how we, I don't know, use our money? What, where, do, where do we buy products from? As much as possible, buy products made from, what, Canada? is probably the place to buy it, buy it from. I, I would dare say that we have the population with an intelligence level you know, that is, is up there, uh, to refine our own goods. Um, and if it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, finding the labor, well, we, we joined NAFTA for a reason and, you know, we still have a disparity with the peso. I would dare say Mexico would be the, the perfect place for us to be, to be doing business. It's closer. Uh, you know, we can send stuff by rail and by truck if we need to. Um, and you know, Mexico's, a partner of ours where, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's just one opportunity. I would dare see there's others. Um, but you don't, you don't want to necessarily be doing the level of business that we're doing with um, what we consider an enemy. They're a threat nation. They're not our friends. They're a communist country. You know, it's, it's not <laughs> when, when the people were leaving Russia and, you know, during a, the Olympics or something like that, what do we call those people? Defectors. So, how is it that they're leaving China in droves and bringing illicit money and, and infiltrating our politics and doing all these things? And they're just, they're okay. Yeah, yeah. That's all right. Yeah. They're not doing that without the knowledge and the blessing, the approval of the Chinese state. That's right. Exactly. So this has been a eye opening discussion uh, and I've really appreciated the audience questions. I really, uh, 
uh, thank you for participating. And I um, wish you all the very best, Scott, as you continue to uh, analyze uh, this very important set of revelations. And I, I thank you for writing the, the uh, book, The Mosaic Effect. And uh, I just encourage people to, to look at that book and to also open up their eyes when it comes to this very real war that's being waged on our dear country. And as Canadians, let this be an opportunity to renew our um, uh, loyalty to our country and, and citizenship and what that means. And I just encourage you to uh, pass this recording on to uh, friends and, and uh, colleagues and ask them, what do you think? What are you observing? Um, and let's keep an eye on the inquiry that's uh, being launched this week. And of course, I'm sure we'll uh, be having you back on, Scott, as we uh, keep track of the pace of the inquiry and see if we can actually uh, start getting to the heart of the matter. So thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, David. You bet. And thanks again, uh, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we're so glad that uh, you can continue to, to support our work and be, make sure you like us and, and share the word. Thank you and have a great day.